Well, welcome to The Perspective. And you're probably thinking, where's Mike? Well, Mike is away this week. I'm Lori Hartshorn and a friend of Mike and The Perspective. And I'll be sitting in for Mike all this week. And we're going on a journey together. It's going to be amazing. You're not going to want to miss a single show. We're going to gain some great perspective on how we can be the person that God created us to be. And we're going to discover what it means to be our authentic selves. You know, in our culture, we hear the term your true self or live your truth or be your authentic self daily. But what does that actually mean? I mean, does it mean doing whatever you want and putting yourself before others without considering anyone else? Or does it mean as long as you're true to yourself, you're making the best choices and you're even pleasing God? Well, to answer those questions, we have a fantastic guest, Dr. Mary Lynn. She's joining us all week to answer these questions and more. And she's a clinical psychologist, executive director of Dr. Lynn and Associates, wise counselor, and a friend. And I've learned so much from Mary. And we will dive into her new book, Rebecoming, Coming Out of Hiding to Live as Your God-Given Essential Self. And in it, Dr. Mary uh, blends her, I would say, personal growth journey, her psychological training, and clinical experience to explain why you and me, we have to first unbecome our inauthentic self to re-become our essential self. So Mary, thank you for joining us. Oh, so glad to be here. We're going to have so much fun this week. We're taking over Mike's show, right? I love it. So you're like, he's not here. We can just (laughs) talk about, right? (laughs) But we are friends of the perspective and I want people to get to know you. I'm sure some of you have seen, some of our viewers have seen you on other shows and programs, but just briefly tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay. Well, as you mentioned, I am a psychologist and I know I look younger than my years. <laughs> I've been in practice for over 30 years. Wow. And it wasn't because I graduated when I was two, you know, definitely older than that. Um, but during the course of my career, I've done lots of different things. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, uh, helping people with mental health issues, um, uh, consulting, coaching, uh, my latest, I'm doing a lot of assessments as well, but a big part of my heart is definitely for the church. Yeah. I worked as a pastor for a few years, right. um, and it is for helping people internationally, um, with just equipping them to be able to really serve Jesus. Yeah. So that's a big part of my heart. Uh, personally, I'm married with two adult kids. Yeah. Um, I'm Taiwanese Canadian. Uh, I live by the lake. I think yeah. that's. And your husband's a great fisherman, I have oh, to say. He, is. he catches the big ones, you know, he like he if does. they're to be caught, Peter's got. Yeah, them. we might have to throw on a few slides of his fish pictures, yeah, but exactly. like, it's like. Ooh, this I big know. fish, yes. Well, I, I've i read your book from beginning to end. Thank you for I doing that. I am on a journey. It's one of those books mm-hmm. that I will reread. And I would say it's a great tool because either certain chapters I'm going to have to go back to because I'm like, oh, shoot, I think that's me, right? Yes. So I thank you for the work you've done here. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful, re-becoming. Um, but you begin by saying this wasn't the book that you intended to write. <laughs> So what, like, I know you could write many things, but what were you thinking you were going to write? Why did you write this? Yes, it wasn't the book I intended to write. I'll tell you during the season leading up to writing this book was probably one of the most difficult seasons I've been going through personally Um, from a career standpoint, just a personal sense of worth. I was actually questioning my calling uh, as to whether I should even be speaking, whether I should have any what, did I have anything of value to say? And I had thought in that I was going to write a book sort of calling out women to live out their full selves and just kind of cheering them on. But it didn't come out in a way that felt authentic to me. And so I sat on it. And um, as I sat on it, it became very evident to me that the reason I couldn't write that book because it would come from a place of performance. Like I'm going to say the right things as an expert, but God was working in me to work through, oh, oh, he was working in me to work through the layers of things that I had to do to unbecome. I had to come out of hiding. Mm. I'm, I, I recognize that so much of my life was about pleasing other people, uh, about trying to do the right thing. But in that, I lost sight of 
who I really was and what God was really calling me to do. So I kind of had to live it out a little bit before I could write it. And then when I did, it just sort of flowed out of me as yeah. God tends to do. Well, you're very vulnerable. Mm. You're very real, mm. which I think, you know, people don't care how much you know. Yeah. Till they know how much you care. Yeah. And you definitely care, Mary. Mm. And all this week, I know that our viewers are going to feel cared for. I hope so. And so I just, like, I'm putting you right on the spot right away. But Go as you for wrote it. the book. Go for it. What was one of the main things that you really learned about yourself? As you oh, learned? my gosh. See, this is the thing. Uh, the book is about transformation. It's about growing self-awareness, but also how it's applied to our life. So I can preach it, girl. Yeah. But and I don't always live it. And I can kind of lie to myself in thinking that I am living it because my intentions are often good. Yeah. But I'm not necessarily watching what it's like on the other side of me. Mm. So I'd actually come from a situation where things had gone really, really south for me. I was shocked because I got feedback from a client that uh, didn't go well. And I like to do well. Like, yeah. I'm a perfectionist. Yeah. And so when I got that feedback, it really, really hurt. And I had to kind of sit on it and pray about it. And then I asked some friends. I said, okay, this happened to me. Surely there's some feedback in it for me to know. What's it like being on the other side of me? And a few brave friends told me that they thought that, you know, Mary, sometimes when you think you're helping people, it can come across as critical. Mm. And it we can make us feel like we're not good enough. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that is the last thing I want. My heart is for people to feel encouraged. So that honest moment um, showed me that once again, although I have insight, I'm not always living it out in my life, nor am I always aware of how other people are experiencing that. So that while my desire to help them might be good, I'm actually causing them hurt or sometimes maybe even harm. Wow. And that was very, very humbling yeah. to recognize that. The fact that you are willing to ask that question says a lot about you. I think as a professional, mm. you've got all the titles, the mm -hmm. doctor, the psychologist, the many yeah. years of experience. You were still willing to ask a question. Mm -hmm. What does it feel like to be on the other side of me? Yeah. And that is a loaded question, one that a lot of us don't want to ask. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the core teachings in your book then is about this, what you call the essential self. Mm -hmm. You were really in your own way asking like, who am I really? That's right. Where is this coming from? Right. Even though I can do all these things. Right. What is my true essential self? Can you just explain what do you mean by the term yes. discovering your essentials, God-given essential self? Yeah, 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 that's a great question because I was using my gifting in that situation, but in reflection, it wasn't coming from a place of authenticity. So essential self, I believe that God has intentionally created each one of us and he has created us with great delight. When he was done, he was just smiling. He was just like, oh my gosh. But he's created us to reflect his glory. Mm -hmm. And because he is so big and so awesome and so mysterious and so beyond, we each get to reflect a tiny bit of his glory. And so if you can imagine if all of us together shined that part of his glory that we're asked to, then the world is even more transformed and it's beautiful. Now, now, the word I came up with essential is because in the um, Hebrew term, like a lot of people talk about the soul. Right. Uh, the Hebrew term for soul is called nephesh. And it, there is no direct translation to English. It's kind of like the best way of saying it. It's you are a soul. Okay. So it's not you have a soul, but you are a soul. And then in Genesis, God talks about let us make humankind in our image. And the word image is essence of God. Yeah. So then I put together essential self. And so it really is the true you that yeah. God has created you to be. Um, and uh, you'd think you'd know it. You'd think you'd know it. <laughs> but yeah. a lot of things happen that can make us go into hiding. Yes. And I think that's the power of this book. And we're going to pick up on that. I'm just going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we're going to talk about this more this idea of our essential self mm. and how our essential self 
is the true self that God wants us to reflect him in the world. That's right. I love it so much. We're going to be right back with Dr. Mary and we're going to learn some more. So don't go away. Well, welcome back. Boy, we're just beginning to learn from Dr. Mary Lynn and her book, Rebecoming. And in Mary's book, she talks about how each one of us is a soul with an essential personal identity rooted in how we reflect the essence of God as his image bearers. And this is one of the things that Mary says, the key to transformation uh, the key to transformation isn't just about becoming our essential self. It's about unbecoming all the things we believed we had to be to be loved. Wow. So Mary, you're talking about our essential self, but we have to unbecome. Mm-hmm. What do you mean unbecome to rebecome? Yes. yes. If you think about, you know, you come into this world, you want to do well. You want to be loved. You want to be accepted. You want to belong. All those things, natural human needs. We all have them. And depending on our experiences growing up, we make certain conclusions of what that looks like. And many times we will, not many times, all of us will experience hurts along the way. And as we do that, we might make conclusions as in, oh, shoot, if I act this way, people will assume that. And you do everything possible to be loved, or at least I do. And so when I talk about unbecoming, it's like all those strategies that we used to try to fit in to try to be accepted, to try to gain love. It's about letting those go yeah. because they're defense mechanisms. There's things that we do to protect ourselves, to protect ourselves from being hurt, yeah. from being rejected, to help us to fit in. And so to, you know, while those strategies work, they don't mm. because they prevent our essential self from coming out because it's almost like a performance. Right. It's almost like we're having to put on something to be able to fit in. So we have to unbecome all the things that we thought we had to do to be loved and accepted Mm -hmm. so that we can truly give freedom for our essential self to come out. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole key. And that's why I also say re-becoming. That's the name of the book because it's not becoming whomever you want to be. You are re-becoming who you were already designed to be. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the key. So I'm thinking about you know, some of the ways in which we hide Hmm. or we, I'm thinking about, I've got little grandkids, as you know. Yeah. So five under the age of six right now. I know. Crazy fun. And I'm watching these little ones, you know, grow and the desire to be loved, Mm -hmm. finding their sense of, am I, do I have, am I loved? Do I have that? And how they can act out good, bad, or ugly in order to feel loved. Yes. So tell us a little bit, give us an example of what can happen in our lives maybe as from childhood that we start putting, maybe wearing a mask or trying to Mm -hmm. hide our true selves in order to feel loved. Mm -hmm. What would that look like? Yeah. Well, I mean, I can use myself as an example because that was part of all of the pulling back of the layers I didn't realize. So I came to Canada when I was one. I was, uh, we were pretty much the only family of color in our uh, neighborhood, because I, without giving away my age, I grew up in the late 60s and 70s. Yeah. And so I uh, am by nature sensitive and I want to be liked. So I learned very quickly to try to be that person that I thought I needed to be. And that was outgoing, funny, smart, do well in school, right. all of these things. Yeah. And they're not necessarily bad in of itself, but that's kind of comes in because of this feeling of insecurity, fear of rejection. So this is for me, and it could be different for other people. And so then you start to take on these strategies or behaviors that seem to work for you to gain that acceptance that you're looking for or respect or whatever it might be that's going on for you. You know, I think it's super helpful because sometimes we're like, well, what am I hiding behind? But we're not aware of some of the roles or 
the things that we've taken on just in order to get approval. And if you come from a traumatic, perhaps oh, exactly. home experience, right? Yeah. Then you can really take on some behaviors that actually aren't who God made you to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're yeah. they're survival strategies, right? And they work for you until they don't. Until they don't, right? And well, it prevents yeah. maturity. That's part of the problem, right? Well, you use this word shadow self. Mm -hmm. So we have the essential yes. self, the God-given who God made you to be. Mm -hmm. And then you have this, you use this word shadow self. And right. here's what you say in your book, in case you don't remember. <laughs> Thank uh, you for the reminder. <laughs> our shadow self can do such a great job of mimicking our essential self and protecting us from our fears, insecurities, and unmet needs that most of us let it take over to the point we don't even recognize it exists. Our shadow self used our favored coping strategies to protect us. Yes. Wow, that hit me hard. Yes. Ultimately, these strategies prevent us from growing and developing, and we literally become a shadow of ourselves. Mm. Ouch. Yeah. You know, we have so much to lose. Like, talk to me first about the shadow self. So right. just give us clarity right. around that. The shadow self is so hard to see. Because yeah. the shadow self looks like us. It's kind of like us, our behaviors, but with a little twist mm -hmm. of internal motivation that's often rooted in insecurities, fears, shame, self-protection. Yeah. Um, and so we can act in ways, if we're not aware, that look godly, that look like we're serving people. And I'm not saying we don't have mixed motives, but when we have that, then we're doing it really more for our own ego needs or to protect ourselves, whatever it might be. Now, I do call it shadow self. Some of people might have read books and hear the reference to true self versus false self. I don't like okay. the term false self okay. because false self sounds like, oh, you got to kick it to the curb. It's bad. I don't want it. But to me, to give honor to our story, shadow self came into being for a purpose. And that was to protect us. Right. As a little kid, think about it. We learned these strategies to protect ourselves. Right. So when we are in a situation where we get triggered and shadow self shows up, mm -hmm. then if I can have compassion for that, for her, what insecurities are being triggered, what fears, what yeah. shame, then I can have insight as to why I'm feeling the way I am. Mm -hmm. But the thing that is different is I don't need to let my shadow self be in control. I can be aware of it but I can still choose to do better. Yeah. And that's the advantage, or that's the importance of not just going, ah, because every time you go like this, get rid of, now go away, shadow self, then you're ignoring what might be some really core issues, yeah. some unmet needs even, things going yeah. on in you that if you're not addressing, you might perpetuate yeah. the same patterns of behavior. Well, it's just, it's amazing in your book because you take people on a journey that helps really unpack mm -hmm. and become more aware of what might be their shadow self. Mm -hmm. You know, we only just have a minute here, but um, there's a lot to at stake here. Yeah. And and why does it matter that we re-become, that we actually live out of the truth of who God made us to be? Oh man, I believe in this so strongly. Like I said, I said, we each get to reflect God's glory in our very unique way. No one else on the face of the planet can reflect his glory in the way that you can. So that, that work of discovering your essential self is so critical to being able to live out the life that God has called you to live. Yeah. Yeah, it's so important. And you know what? That's so biblical and so God's heart for us. Mm -hmm. And I thank you. Like, I thank you in advance for being here all this week because there's so much more mm -hmm. that even practically speaking, we're going to unpack this week as to how can you be more aware of when your shadow self yes. comes out? Yes, yes. And how can you actually become more aware of your true essential mm -hmm. self mm -hmm. so you can live freely? Thank you, Dr. Mary. Oh, so glad to Thank be you here. for being so um, real with us. Mm. And I know we're going to learn a lot from you this week. Thank you. Yeah. Well, do you need prayer? We're here for you. I want you to call our prayer line right now, 1-855-910-6297. And we're here for you. And I hope that this week's shows really encourage you. Hi, I'm Ryan Walter. And during my 15-year NHL career, I signed the odd autograph, especially in Montreal. I remember once there was a young boy and I signed my name and then I put John 316 next to it, underneath it. And he looked up at his dad and he said, Dad, he's wrong. 
my name's not John, and it's 3.30. <laughs> I love that story. You know what I love about John 3.16 is that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Love that idea. You know where I've been going recently, though, is to John 3.17, Right? Where in 16 he sent, but in 17 he says, I didn't send. I didn't send my son to judge the world. I sent my son to save the world. Love that thought. During my teenage years, I was serving at a camp in their leadership training program, and I memorized Psalm 139. And although I may not get every word right now, this Psalm's truth continues to impact how I view life. You know, this Psalm that David wrote reminded us that God knows everything. And David takes the theology of omniscience, which essentially means God knows everything, and brings it down to a personal level. <laughs> to David, God's omniscience is not theological or philosophical. It's relational and personal. It isn't just that God knows everything about everything, but he knows everything about you and about me. I mean, listen to the personal pronouns in verses 1 to 3. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. David doesn't say, Lord, you know all things and you've searched all things. Instead, he says, you know me. You've searched me. He knows how you and I go about our day when we leave our house or where we drive our car or hop on the bus and when we return home at the end of the day. He even knows our thoughts. God knows exactly where you are and what you're thinking about now. It may be a little uncomfortable to know that you're being watched. It might feel a little like a reality TV show, but yet our unease with being watched can be based on the fact that we doubt the good intentions of those who watch us. See, I love watching my grandchild in the baby monitor. It should be comforting even to know that they're being watched over by loving parents and grandparents. Well, you see, our God is a loving God who watches over us, not to point out our faults and say, aha, I caught you doing that again. Rather, he cares about every aspect of our life. The psalm is so personal. It's a personal reminder that God loves us and he sees us and he knows everything about us. He created us to be uniquely us. But before we think it's all about us, the main emphasis is not actually on you or me. In the Hebrew grammar, you know, you discern, you search, you perceive, you are familiar. These phrases, they emphasize, the emphasis there is on you, which is referring to God himself. It's pointing out God's divine involvement in our lives. I mean, listen to it again with the emphasis on being on God rather than us. You, God, have searched me. And you, God, know me. You know when I sit. And when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Doesn't that reading make it clear who our God is? God is personal. He's loving. And he knows you. No matter where you are, he knows. No matter what you're thinking, he knows. No matter what you do, he knows. And he loves you. See, David begins the psalm by saying, you search me and know me. And he ends the psalm by saying again, search me, God, know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, when you know who God is, that he knows your true God-given essential self and he loves you, you welcome him to reveal anything in your thoughts or your behaviors that may be hindering you from being the person he created you to be. 
So today, I want to encourage you, ask God to show you anything that may be holding you back from living out your God-given design. Ask him to reveal any belief or thought that may be blocking you from seeing yourself the way he sees you. Then live the life he designed you to live because that's what you were made for. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel like I've got so much to process after sitting with Dr. Mary and learning even more what she's sharing in her book about re-becoming. And, you know, as we talk about this essential self, this God-given beautiful design that God has uniquely made you, you don't want to hide, right? You don't want to live in a way that either you've lost that. And I like her term, shadow self. Like, what is it in your life or my life that maybe we're hiding behind because of fear or self-protection, or we had to, you know, try to become something for other people. And we've lost an, our true understanding of how God made us. I want you to come back tomorrow and the next day and the next day and keep learning with us so that, as Mary says, you can come out of hiding to live as your God-given essential self. Um, you can find this book, Read Coming, uh, where all books are sold, and I encourage you to get a copy it's a great resource for you and for others. You know, as I was uh, thinking about Psalm 139 today and just the power of this beautiful message of really know how God made you. He knows everything about you and he loves you and you want to live out of that truth. I think it's just a reminder that, you know, we, can, we don't know who we really are unless we come into relationship with God that we can look to all the places in this world to find ourselves and we'll never find ourselves until we find the one who made us. So I encourage you to today to say yes to Jesus. Yes to the one who came to show us how much he loves us, to show us a way to the Father, to show us who we were meant to be. And I, if you need prayer, I want you to call us at 1-855-910-6297 so we can pray with you and for you. But would you surrender your whole self to God today? Would you welcome him to show you who you really are and to even show you what maybe you're hiding behind? What shadow are you carrying in your life that you want to be free of? And I want you to join us tomorrow as we learn even more from Dr. Mary and Rebecoming. Well, thanks for watching The Perspective today. And it's a privilege to be here as a friend of The Perspective. And I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow.